Good evening. I will call this meeting of the City Council for the City of Salem for Monday, October 11th, 2021 to order. If the recorder will please call the roll. Councilor Stapleton. Here. Councilor Anderson. Present. Councilor Phillips. Here. Councilor Leung. Councilor Gonzalez. Here. Councilor Hoy. Here. Councilor Nordyke. Here. Councilor Lewis. Here. Mayor Bennett is absent. Thank you. Thank you. And if you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Councilor Anderson, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? Yes, we do. I move addition in, um, 1.3C, Proclamation for Indigenous Peoples Day. Second. Moved and seconded for additions and deletions. Any discussion? Councillor Lewis. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is uh, procedurally appropriate, but on agenda item 3.3C, we received comments from Mark Wig. I'd like to add the city manager's response letter to the record tonight. Mr. City Attorney. Um, we can, we can provide the, the response once we you know, have a copy of it to include them in the record. We don't need a motion for that necessarily. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And if the recorder will please call the roll. Councilor Phillips. Okay. Councilor Phillips. I, I clicked. I, I can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Councillor Leung is still absent. Okay. And Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. And Mayor Bennett is absent. <clears throat> Motion passes. Time for uh, council and city manager comments. Anybody have any? Councilor Nordyke. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be back remotely once again and happy October. I have a few quick updates for you. Uh, first, I don't normally discuss the day job, but I had a major milestone last week. Um, as many of you know, I'm a senior assistant attorney general of the Oregon Department of Justice, where I've served the people of Oregon for 12 years. And last week, a case two years in the making resulted in a four-day jury trial where the plaintiff sought $2 million in Oregon taxpayer funds. And I'm happy to report that the verdict was unanimously no. And I want to give a shout out to all my fellow counselors with a day job because what a lot of people don't realize is that we are all unpaid city counselors and even an unpaid mayor. And many, us, many of us have emergencies that come up during the day job. Some of us literally, like Councillor Phillips, have emergencies come up during the day job. So I appreciate everyone's patience when it comes to responding to constituent feedback, responding to the many calls and emails that we receive. Um, I hesitate to speak for my colleagues in saying we all appreciate everything that you do to tell us how you feel about issues of the day. And I also want to remind you that sometimes life intervenes and I am looking forward to getting caught up on all the emails that was sent to me over this last week. But I also want to celebrate any milestones that my other colleagues have in their lives, in their careers, and so on. Because at the end of the day, we're all people trying to do what's best. So there's that. Two more quick points. While I'm on the topic of public participation, I want to thank every person who has signed up to participate and provide testimony tonight. When this council used to meet in person before the pandemic, 
it was not uncommon to see a lot of people sign up to testify in person and give their side of the story on all sides of issues before council, whether it's climate change, addressing homelessness, and so much more. I truly feel that the benefit of the multiple perspectives and the diverse lived experiences that come before us is absolutely critical to the democratic process, especially when we're looking at complex challenges that face our city, oftentimes with no easy solution. So I wanna thank everyone who's testified at a previous council meeting for taking the time out of your day, time away from your family and your own life's obligations and I want to thank everyone who has signed up to testify tonight as well. Thank you for making your voices heard. Last but not least, I want to, I want to congratulate and welcome everyone who is in participating today, either remotely or afar in Indigenous Peoples Day. We have had our, we will be hearing a proclamation on that later, so I won't belabor the point, but I'm so happy to see our seat see our state celebrate the many indigenous peoples that call Oregon home. We had a wonderful celebration today at the Rotary Amphitheater at Riverfront Park with singing and dancing and spoken word to celebrate all indigenous people on Kalapuya land. I think it is fitting that our newest, greatest and latest community stage was there to welcome indig indigenous children indigenous men and women and elders to celebrate this historic day. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Councillor Gonzalez. Thank you, Council President. You know, and I usually introduce myself in multiple languages to highlight our city's longtime diversity, but today I decided not to in order to recognize Indigenous People Day as all these other languages came after them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Councillor Anderson. Thank you very much, uh, Council President Hoy. Uh, I too join with my colleagues in Indigenous People Day, and I also will say that my day job uh, kept me from uh, being there today, but we need to celebrate the folks who were here and whose land um, we basically took. Uh, now, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I'm going to talk again about another um, pedestrian accident that happened, on, a pedestrian car accident that happened on October 2nd at approximately 1.10 a.m. at the corner of 17th Street, between, or 17th Street between Silverton Road and Woodrow Street Northeast. There was a hit and run. The victim of that hit and run was very seriously injured. Her name is Juana Sebastian Juan. She's 24. She's in the hospital. The police are investigating this because this is seriously a serious crime. And uh, uh, if you have any information, it was uh, Saturday, October 2nd at approximately 1.10 a.m. in the area of the Oregon State Fairgrounds, please call the traffic team hotline at 503 588-6293. Many of the car pedestrian accidents we have in our fair city are either the result of, uh, of, of system, systemic failures in terms of high speed limits and everything else are accidents. But something like this, a hit and run where the, the driver who seriously injured another person leaves, that's something that we gotta to pursue to the highest degree uh, we can. And so if you have any information, please call the traffic team hotline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Anderson, Councilor Phillips. Thank you, Council President Hoy. Um, so I just wanna remind everybody that, you know, we're still living in the middle of a pandemic and that we've, we've as a community done the work to really flatten the curve. The number of new cases is starting to fall a little bit. Um, we're getting close to the kind of grim milestone of 4,000 deaths here in the state of Oregon, but that's far fewer than other states across the nation. And that's because of the work we've all done by wearing masks when we're out in public and by getting vaccinated. Um, eight days ago at work, I was able to get my annual influenza shot. Um, I know Salem Hospital has the goal of getting 100% of staff vaccinated this year as they do every year. Um, so, you know, just doing those simple preventative things makes a huge difference. Um, 
I mean, when you when you come to me in an emergency or any of my colleagues in the Salem Hospital Emergency Department, we'll we'll treat you well. We'll take great care of you. But you can prevent so many of those those visits by just, you know, doing the simple preventative actions of wearing a mask when you're out in public or getting vaccinated with the, the COVID-19 vaccines that are free, safe, effective and convenient and, and the uh, annual influenza shot. So I just want to plug those things. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Counselor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Um, just real quickly, I wanted to um, acknowledge that today is National Coming Out Day and uh, so much happening today, um, all good things. Um, and I wanted to take the time to highlight one of our LGBTQIA plus community uh, businesses in downtown Salem. I was there this weekend and uh, it was a real treat. Um, that is Flowers in the Alley, which is uh, right down, downtown in between uh, Chemeketa and Court Street in the alley there. A wonderful spot. I love how these businesses are um, moving into different areas and experiencing, uh, just bringing a different experience to the city. So um, happy coming out day to everyone in our LGBTQIA plus community. And uh, thank you to everybody else, um, staff and council here who are elevating Indigenous Peoples Day. Look forward to that proclamation. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Uh, Councillor Leung. Um, thank you. Um, so a um, few announcements I wanted to make. Um, some, I think some of the other counselors had also said it, but again, today is Indigenous Peoples Day and our Salem community is celebrated earlier today from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. at our Rotary uh, Amphitheater. Um, due to work obligations, I was not able to attend, though I hope other counselors and our community were able to attend the event and I hope in the future to be able to attend this important day. Another comment I wanted to make is we're still seeing people and pedestrians in particular and bicyclists be killed by distracted or careless drivers. Please, if you're driving a vehicle, pay attention to the roads. It is now the fall season and less daytime hours. As a driver, you're required to pay attention to the road and watch out for more pedestrians and people on bicycles. As pedestrians and bicyclists, please also do your part. Wear colors that reflect. Don't wear jet black. I had to leave and go um, leave for work the other day at around five in the morning. Someone jumped out on the street wearing jet black and I almost, I didn't, didn't even see them. I just saw them kind of just walk on by you kind of scared me so please if you are walking in the middle of the night or early morning wear reflective good gear um, wear something bright bring a flashlight when you walk even wear those glow in the dark um, attire that you might fit with your child in during halloween and th that's not just for halloween it's for safety and it could cost as little as a dollar from the dollar tree um, be sure to attend some of the city safety events um, especially when they're giving out things for free wear reflective gear. I also want to make a brief announcement that I do have to step away briefly from about 625 to about 715 for a work obligation. That's why I'm all decked up like this. Though I plan to be back to discuss other items to include my thoughts and to maybe be able to hopefully make a vote on the motion set forth by Councillor Lewis, item 5B. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Well, I would just like to say, uh, First, uh, the mayor is not able to be with us this evening, so I'm uh, billing in for him. And uh, so I ask your indulgence and your forgiveness in any uh, missteps I might make. I'm going to do my best. Uh, we'll get through this together. So I also wanted to mention that on Friday, I, it was my great honor to speak at the ribbon cutting for the uh, remodel uh, and addition to McKay High School. If you haven't been out there since the, the remodel was done, it is a remarkable addition to the high school. The library is amazing. Uh, I toured the, the entire school with the, the principal and some others, and uh, they have a uh, food service area, a choir area, performing arts that are just amazing. And it's really an asset to Northeast Salem and to the 2,500 students who attend McKay. And so I was really pleased to, to participate in that. And so um, that's all I have, Mr. Uh, Manager. I understand you have some comments, perhaps. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to draw Council's attention to a, a report that is in tonight's agenda packet for your work session next Monday with the Planning Commission regarding our Salem. I encourage you to read the report. If you have any questions between uh, 
tonight, if, if you're going to read it tonight after this meeting and, and next Monday, please uh, reach out to staff. As you all know, Eunice Kim is the our Salem expert. And if she can't answer your question, she can get you with the staff person who can. Uh, that is a, a, a key uh, work session uh, for council and the planning commission to have the our Salem work uh, continue. Also, uh, our Salem is one of several initiatives underway where the city is requesting public involvement and comment. Uh, virtual opportunities to provide input on the police strategic plan, stormwater report, the library strategic plan, needs of businesses, the tree canopy, and we're helping chariots spread the word about potential locations for a new transit center in South Salem. So virtual opportunities for our residents, for the public to provide a uh, comment input on, on some really key initiatives uh, that are underway and that will be coming to council uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Now we are on to proclamations and we have three tonight. So you're gonna to get to hear, hear quite a bit from me for a few minutes. And first up, I am pleased to welcome Suzanne Reynolds, the Code Compliance Division Manager, and a number of her staff. And she, there you are, Suzanne. Hello, thank you for being here. And she will be receiving the proclamation on behalf of the many professional Code Compliance staff members that we have here at the city. I have to say, just as an editorial comment, uh, the Code Compliance team is, they do such amazing work. They, they are at our neighborhood meetings. They, they address so many issues that neighborhood associations and residents have uh, regarding livability and things that just make, make Salem a better place. And I greatly appreciate every one of them. And so I just wanted to say that before I read this proclamation, Suzanne. Thank you so much for being here. With that, whereas in 2005, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, President George W. Bush established October as National Code Compliance Month, in acknowledgement of the importance and impact that code enforcement has on communities. And whereas code compliance officers who are members of the American Association of Code Enforcement provide for the safety, health, and welfare of residents living in communities throughout the United States by enforcing building, zoning, housing, environmental, and property maintenance codes and ordinances. And whereas dedicated and well-trained Using AACE guidelines, City of Salem code compliance officers are highly responsible individuals who are proud of their code compliance department and its proactive efforts to control blight in the city. And whereas City of Salem code compliance officers are committed to promoting life safety as well as improving neighborhood aesthetics, their duties can have a major impact on property values and overall image of the city. And Whereas code compliance officers have a very intricate, challenging, and demanding job, and one that can profoundly impact the quality of our lives. And now, therefore, I, Chuck Bennett, Mayor of the City of Salem, do hereby call upon all residents to observe October 2021 as National Code Compliance Month, and ask that residents recognize the positive impacts made by Salem's code compliance officers, as well as their, ro their role as public servants, dated the 11th day of October 2021. Suzanne, would you like to introduce your staff members who are here? And would you like to say a few words? I really would. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we have Officer Morales and Officer Hedrick here. They're our most senior officers. And uh, if you haven't met them, I'm sure you will at some point. Um, good evening, everyone. I so greatly appreciate the fact that you're taking the time tonight to recognize the dedication of this city code enforcement officers to this community. This profession is so often a mystery, um, especially in Salem, where we have so many specialties and such a vast code to enforce. Even if citizens are aware of um, code enforcement, they still rarely understand the breadth of the work done by this very small amount of people. In compliance services alone, we have a multifamily inspectors, a dangerous building inspector, district officers that enforce everything from abandoned vehicles to health hazards, and even a park ranger. Um, planning has a zoning inspector, and public works has, we call him a code enforcement officer, and they call him a program coordinator, and he does a ton of work 
the knowledge that these people are required to do their jobs is actually mind boggling. Each officer embodies multiple roles within the context of their job. They are problem solvers, mediators, and most of all, educators with the common goal of ensuring a more livable community. Speaking to my team alone, um, during these recent days of uncertainty with COVID-19 and the rise of homelessness, homelessness in our community, this hardworking crew has literally done everything and stepped up to every challenge they were asked to, even working for different divisions at some points. I can't say enough for how much I appreciate this team and this group of individuals. And no matter what I say, my words will fall short to the work that I do. I am really proud to work for them. Thank you, Mayor Bennett, although he is not here and all of you council and um, the city manager for actually giving the opportunity to let them hear that they are valued. Well, thank you. And thank you for being here. And I want to echo everything you just said. I can tell you just from personal experience, Officer Morales, and I know he's just one of many, but he is legendary out here in East Salem. And uh, I thought we were going to have a situation recently when he was transferred to another, uh, another area of town because he is beloved by folks out here in East Salem. And so we greatly appreciate his service and all of the staff service. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Proclamation number two is recognizing National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And we have Tim Rochak here from Garten Services. Good evening, can you hear me? We can, yes, thank you for being here. I had some technical difficulties. I thought I had surpassed that about, uh, oh, I don't know, 12 months into the pandemic, but I guess not. Things happen, that's for sure. I'll go ahead and read the proclamation and then we'll, go, then we'll uh, get back to you and have you, give you a chance to speak. So whereas National Disability Employment Awareness Month had its origins in 1945, when Congress declared the first week in October as National Employee the Physically Handicapped Week, with the word physically removed in 1962 to acknowledge individuals' needs and contributions with all kinds of disabilities, in 1988, Congress expanded the week to a month and whereas the 2021 theme, America's Recovery Powered by Inclusion, reflects the importance of ensuring that people with disabilities have full access to employment and community involvement during the national recovery from COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas recognizing the resolve and de determination of people with disabilities, the city of Salem is proud to collaborate with area agencies such as Garten Services and Project Search to advance and promote a diverse and productive wor workforce and Whereas by working with our community partners, the city of Salem is committed to opening its doors to residents, including an innovative nine month internship program for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And now therefore I Chuck Bennett, mayor of the city of Salem, Oregon, do hereby proclaim October, 2021 as National Disability Employment Awareness Month and encourage all residents and businesses to participate in actively putting people with disabilities to work and recognizing their important contributions to our local economy, dated this 11th day of October, 2021. Mr. Rochak, thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity, I really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to thank on behalf of Garten, our board of directors and our 250 employees with and without disabilities. I wanted to thank the city of Salem for recognizing the contribution people with diverse abilities and disabilities can make in our workforce and our community. Near the beginning of the pandemic, Garten celebrated our 50th anniversary as an organization. And uh, I, I like to say that Garten was about sustainability before it was cool. Um, but the city of Salem, uh, I wanna point out that the city of Salem like Garten and a lot of other community businesses has understood that sustainability is about more than just environmental sustainability. It's more than about financial sustainability. And the city has embraced the social justice aspect of sustainability. And so uh, we, we want to congratulate that, whether uh, congratulate the city for that, whether it's uh, hosting Project Search or summer youth interns from Garten, uh, gaining work experience at city job sites, 
or hiring uh, Garden and other organizations like ours and providing opportunities for people with disabilities doing electronics recycling, doing custodial work, doing mail services. Um, and I think you, uh, many of you have seen our crews downtown doing downtown beautification and cleanup. Um, all of those are opportunities that the city has created. So the city of Salem is walking the talk and we're very impressed with that. Um, I'd also like to just close by thanking all the local employers because I know the city is not the only uh, forward thinking employer that understands the contribution people with disabilities can make uh, to help a business be successful. So I wanna thank all of the employers in our uh, city and the surrounding areas for the opportunities that they provide people with disabilities. I have one visual aid. This is usually in my office um, and it usually is the backdrop to my Zoom camera, but I had to use a backup system today. So I'm just gonna present you with Dorothy. Obviously this is just a, a, a sign of Dorothy but um, I keep her looking over my shoulder because Dorothy's a great example of how this sustainability around social justice works. Um, for all the local employers that have made a, a contribution by opening your workforce for folks with disabilities, Dorothy is a person that worked in Garton's recycling building in a sheltered setting for about 30, 25 years. And she insisted that she never wanted to work anywhere else, that that was the place for her and could we provide her a job forever? Well, it's our mission to help provide uh, Dorothy and people like her with training and the opportunity for other businesses to see what a great employee Dorothy can be. And I'm happy to tell you that this is from the, the celebration we did when Dorothy was hired by Geppetto's Italian restaurant here in Salem. Um, it was under the pandemic, we had to be careful and use precautions. So we had a parade outside Dorothy's apartment celebrating her accomplishment and her moving on to the next stage of her life. So uh, thank you to all of the employers in this community, folks like Geppetto's for, for doing your part in providing those opportunities. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for being here. And thank you, Ms. Lockwood. I apologize for not introducing you before. I apologize. Thank you. All right. And we will go on to the third proclamation. When uh, I, found that I was going to be uh, chairing this meeting, I uh, jumped at the opportunity to actually um, have my own proclamation. The last two were on behalf of the mayor, but this one uh, is from me. So I'm, I'm very happy to be signing this proclamation this evening. Whereas from time immemorial, Oregon lands have been home to many indigenous peoples, including members of the San Yam Calabuya, whose ancestral homelands include the area known as Salem Kaiser today and throughout the surrounding Monument Valley area, including what is now the city of Salem. They have lived and prospered by maintaining strong cultural ties to the land and through wise management of resources. And whereas in 2020, the city of Salem signed an agreement with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon. And in 2021, the city signed an agreement with the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians in order to strengthen the relationship between the city and the tribes. And Whereas the San Yam Calabuya were signers of the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, which ceded their homelands to the United States in exchange for certain goods and benefits, while affirming other pre-existing rights, many were subsequently removed from their homelands to the Grand Ronde Indian Reservation, where they became members of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. Others were moved to the Siletz Coast Reservation, where they became members of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians of Oregon. And whereas in later years, some San Yam Calipuya married with other indigenous peoples and relocated to the other reservations, including Warm Springs, where they became members of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, these tribes and others have moving stories of tragedy, triumph, and perseverance that need to be shared with future generations. Whereas we affirm our commitment to fostering a deeper understanding and appreciation of the diversity of cultures and celebrating all that indigenous people do to cultivate a community that honors and respects the diverse history of Salem. Whereas on May 18, 2021, the Oregon Legislative Assembly approved House Bill 2526, approving the second Monday in October as Indigenous Peoples Day. And now therefore, I, Chris Hoy, Council President of the Salem City Council, do hereby proclaim October 11, 2021 as Indigenous Peoples Day and encourage residents to join in learning about and honoring the culture and recognize the contributions of Indigenous peoples have made to our country and our state and to our community. Dated this 11th 
day of October, 2021. Thank you. And with that, we will move on. Item 1.4, no, nope, we don't have any presentations, but we do have members of the public signed up for public comment. We will start with Kimberly Eve. Can you see me? No, not, no, we can't. Because my video, the host has asked me to start my video. There we go. Okay. There you are. There I All am. Right. There I am. And as a reminder, you have three minutes. Yes, and sir. if you could uh, state your name and either your address or your award number, and okay. when the time ends, if you would just end your comments, that would be great. Thank you so much Perfect. for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. Uh, Kimberly Eve, I'm a Salem Town resident on 2035 Banyan Court Northwest. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak again this evening. I spoke at the 927 meeting, which was only two weeks ago. Seems like longer, but it was only two weeks. Um, since the 927 meeting, it's become clear to myself and other residents in Salem Town and the apartments that are adjoining the homeless camp that's slated currently to be at the Wallace Road and Brush College uh, location. It became obvious to us that the missed communication on the part of the planners and the organizers to the prospective neighbors of this site was perhaps not accidental. It was clear that you didn't want a repeat of what you got from the Pringle Park neighbors when they discovered that there was a part uh, site that was planned for their neighborhood and approximately 50 of them went to somebody's office and ultimately succeeded in getting that site moved to Wallace Road and Rush College. <laughs> However, if the council and the others that attended our meeting last week in Salem Town on the 5th of October, if you were expecting a crowd of feeble old people, you were surprised. More than 200 people showed up for that meeting and not one of us was feeble. We are educated, articulate, passionate homeowners that are concerned for our safety and well-being and equally as concerned for the safety of the young families who would be even closer to this campsite than we would be. The children in the apartment complexes will be subject to up close and personal interactions with these individuals and that is terrifying to all of us. One of those children I might note um, importantly is a nine-year-old autistic boy. So if any of you are familiar with autism, he thrives on routine and feeling safe and protected. And that protection and feeling of safety could be uh, compromised. Several questions were answered at the Salem Town meeting. Uh, we got several answers that we were looking for. However, many other questions were answered with repeated statistics of success stories for other sites and comments that we felt made were made to incite guilt on our part for what seemed to be a lack of support and empathy that you were feeling from the Salem Town community. Not one person in that meeting argued that the project wasn't needed. Not one of us expressed a lack of concern about the homeless populations or a disregard with their need for safe housing and services. We all expressed our concern about the location and its proximity to vulnerable West Salem residents and their families. Thank you, I'm sorry your time has expired. I do wanna clarify one thing that um, the, the site over at Pringle Hall was, a, was not the same as what we're contemplating on Wallace Road. That was an emergency drop-in shelter. This is a micro shelter where people uh, would would not come and go like they would have at the emergency shelter. So I did just want to clarify that. Councilor Lewis. Yes, thank you, Council President Hoy. Uh, Kimberly, good to see you again. And um, we'll be discussing later in the meeting tonight um, the issue of communication. But but I must I must say that I'm disappointed that you would think that the city of Salem would do this uh, on purpose. And I, I object to that. Um, and I assure you that that is not the case. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Ms. Eve? 
All right. Thank you for being here. Steve Anderson. Good evening. Uh, I guess uh, President Hoy and the rest of the council. Uh, my name is Steve Anderson. I'm with the West Salem Neighborhood Association Land Use Chair. I live at 13, well, 3240 Giller Road Northwest. I'm here to talk about the Marine Drive issues on the agenda tonight, 3.3C and 3.3E. The Neighborhood Association has been very supportive of staff and the purchases of right-of-way in this project since it came out of council about a year and a half ago. So the Neighborhood Association would ask the council to support these purchases. Staff has worked hard on that. It's taken them some time, but it's a valid part of the Marine Drive right-of-way. It will also provide lands for uh, multifamily and low-income income family, which will be beneficial to our community. So we ask you as you consider that to accept the staff report and vote that in the affirmative. We are pleased that they've made progress. We look forward to the completion of the right-of-way purchase, including the four properties at uh, Fifth and Cameo North to their current Marine Drive Fifth Street connection. So thank you for your time. And uh, we hope that you support that and vote it for the staff has done a great work. We're supportive of it and it goes to that project the council passed about a year and a half ago. So thank you, President thank you, Mr. Hoy. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Are there any questions for Mr. Anderson? All right, thank you for your comments and thank you for being here this evening. Next, we have Alulu Ryan Pugh. Councilor Hoy, we don't have a person by that name in our queue right now, nor do we have oh. the next person on the list. All right, so that concludes uh, public comment then. We'll move on to the consent calendar. Councilor Anderson, you're up. Thank you, Council President Roy. I move the consent calendar with the exception of the following pulls, 3.3C and 3.3E, pulled in the third person by Councilor Anderson, and 3.3F, uh, pulled by Councilor Lewis. The remaining part of the consent calendar is as follows. Stand, stand by. We need a second first. Yeah. Do I second. have a second? Second. Seconded by Councilor Phillips. Thank you. Councilor Anderson, go ahead. Thank you. Here's the remaining part of the consent calendar. Uh, 3.1A and 3.1B, which are minutes of the work session and the council meeting, the last two. 3.2A, which is a resolution to accept a loan from the Safe Drinking Water Revolving Fund for Sleepy Hollow Water System um, uh, Integration. They're joining the city water. 3.2B is modification and addition of Public Works and Community Development Department fees. 32 C is transfer of fiscal year 2022 general fund and cultural tourism fund appropriations. 3.3A uh, is uh, approval of a lease with uh, Pentacle Theater uh, for city owned retail space in the Liberty Parkade. 3.3B uh, is um, assessing properties within Sleepy Hollow phase one water system. We discussed that earlier for water system improvements when connecting to the city of Salem. 3.3C is one of the pulled items. 3.3D is an intergovernmental agreements with the East Salem Service District and Labish Village uh, Sewage and Drainage District. 3.3E is pulled. 3.3 G is the institution of a hiring bonus program uh, for um, police officer lateral transfers and also for other very difficult positions to fill in the city. And that's the extent of the consent calendar that has not been pulled. Thank you, Councillor. Any discussion? Seeing them, will the recorder please call the roll? Councillor Leung, she's absent right this time. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Councillor Lewis? 
Aye. Councilor Stapleton? Aye. Councilor Anderson? Aye. Councilor Phillips? Aye. Mayor Bennett is absent. Motion passes, thank you. On to item 4A, uh, public hearing. The reporter would read the title. The city council will now conduct a public hearing regarding a city initiated vacation of public right of way located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Liberty Road South and Pembroke Street Southeast. The applicable criteria is SRC 255.065B6. Testimony, arguments, and evidence must be directed toward the applicable criteria or other criteria which the person believes to apply to the decision. A failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue shall preclude appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals on that issue. A similar failure to raise constitutional issues relating to proposed conditions of approval precludes an action for damages in circuit court. No individual signed up to testify, nor did any neighborhood associations. So the hearing will be conducted with the staff presentation first, followed by questions from council. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any uh, ex parte contacts or abstentions that the council needs to declare? Seeing none, we will move on to the staff report. Uh, Mr. Gamalo. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hoy. Um, let me, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Just give me one moment. All right. Okay, there we are. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Anthony Gamalo, and I am a senior transportation with the public uh, senior transportation planner with the Public Works Department. I would like to enter the staff report into the record. Uh, this is a public hearing to consider a city initiated petition uh, to vacate public right of way located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Liberty Road and Pembroke Street Southeast. Uh, you can see the property located here on the map um, right off of uh, Liberty Road South. Uh, it's on the northeast corner of the intersection with Pembroke uh, Street Southeast uh, north of the uh, Skyline Road intersection. Uh, this is the area to be vacated. Um, this vacation is a, a little bit of a strange one. It's intended to correct an error that was made in 2009. Uh, in preparing to surplus this property in 2009, uh, staff recommended that city council uh, dedicate additional right of way along the frontage of both Pembroke Street uh, and Liberty Road for future transportation needs. Uh, the resolution making this dedication was approved by council on May 26th 2009. Uh, however, while the map uh, attached to the resolution showed the correct area to be dedicated, the text of the resolution mistakenly referred to the entire lot, uh, including the former fire station that is uh, currently located on the property. Uh, for the city to be able to surplus this property, a vacation is required to correct that error. Uh, vacation proceedings were initiated in December in 2009. Uh, but those proceedings were suspended in 2010 following a decision to use the former fire station to store uh, police department bomb, bomb squad vehicles. Um, with construction of the new police facility, there is no longer a city uh, use for the former fire station. Um, staff is recommending that a condition be attached to this vacation uh, as a corner lot. Um, our city standards direct that uh, driveway access be taken from the lower classification of street which in this case is Pembroke Street. Um, Liberty is a, an arterial, Pembroke is a, a local road. Um, so for this reason, uh, the recommended condition is that driveway access not be permitted onto Liberty Road South as uh, part of the vacation. Um, that's it, uh, thank you very much. I can take any questions that you have. Um, I'll also add that if, uh, if council does choose to go ahead and approve the vacation, uh, first reading of the ordinance will occur uh, later uh, in tonight's agenda. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Gamalo. Are there any questions for staff? Uh, 
Okay, and, and again, we didn't have anybody from the Neighborhood Association or other interested parties sign up. This was a city initiated um, petition, so it's not, there aren't other folks to speak. Uh, give me a look over to the city attorney to make sure we're good to go. Yeah, it's okay to close uh, the hearing. Thank you, that was the Zoom pause. Uh, <laughs> if there are no questions for staff, I will, oh, no, Councilor Anderson. I'm prepared to make the motion. I think that's my role. Oh. As... Nope. nope. That's it's actually going to be Councilor Nordyke, but I'll let me close the hearing first. I'll be prepared we'll close to second the... it then. Awesome. We'll close the public hearing. And uh, Councilor Nordyke, do you have a motion? Yes, I do. One moment. I'm scrolling down to the appropriate one. Okay. I make a motion to approve the vacation of public right-of-way located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Liberty Road South and Pembroke Street Southeast, subject to the condition that no driveways be permitted to or from the vacated area onto Liberty Road South. Second. We moved and seconded. Any discussion? All right, will the recorder please call the roll? Councilor Gonzalez. Aye. Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Lewis. Aye. Councilor Stapleton. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Phillips. Aye. Councilor Leung is absent. Mayor Bennett is absent. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. And we are now on to item 5A. And I believe um, Mr. Atchison is up for that one. Uh, no prepared staff report, but the uh, resolution will extend uh, the city's emergency declaration regarding uh, M sheltered residents through June 28, 2022. All right. Any discussion? Councilor Anderson. You're on mute, Councillor. You're on mute. You're on mute, Councillor. I think there's a Scrivener's error, City Attorney Atchison, on page two, uh, second paragraph from the bottom of a, a from the background. It says resolution will extend the emergency declaration to June 28, 2021. And I know the resolution says 2022, but I just want to point that out for the record that's, and we all understand we're doing it to June 28th of next year, not retroactively to June 28th of this year. Thank you, fellow counselor. Thank you. Any other, uh, Councilor Lewis? Yes, um, I'll be voting for the motion, but I wanna point out on page two of the staff report that the, the first full paragraph reads resolution Number 2021-11 established basic requirements for managed camps that they not be located in single family residential zones. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilor Anderson, do we have a motion? Yes, I do. And now that I know I'm supposed to make it, I move the staff recommendation to adopt resolution 2021-41 to extend the declaration of emergency related to unsheltered residents to June 28, 2022. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? The recorder will please call the roll. Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Lewis. Aye. Councilor Stapleton. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Phillips. Aye. Councilor Leung is absent. Councilor Gonzalez. Aye. And Mayor Bennett is absent. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 5B, Councilor Lewis. Thank you, uh, Council President Hoy. Um, I move that the city council reconsider its decision to establish and manage temporary camp at the 2700 Wallace Road parcel within city owned commercial retail zone portion. Second. If I may speak to the first motion, um, uh, 
Yes. And I'm going to read from the staff report. I'm hoping that folks have had a chance to read it. Um, if the motion is to reconsider is passed by council, I will move to the city council withdraw its approval to establish a managed temporary camp at the site until staff has completed its analysis of the site to determine whether it is feasible and two, staff has met with interested West Salem neighbors to discuss alternative sites with West Salem. If I may speak to the motion. Sure. Um, I'm going to start this way, a little different, but it, it's funny. It was just about 50 years ago today that I was sitting in a sociology class at Oregon State University. And I remember clearly the, uh, the professor saying, communication is the key. I was fortunate enough uh, last week to have a, a meeting with the uh, new West Salem High School principal, Carlos Ruiz, and they have just finished their visioning and mission statements. And guess what? At the very top, communication. So it would appear that communication has been pretty important, at least over the last 50 years. Um, I believe that the, I believe we failed to communicate well enough to be able to move forward with this decision. For those that need to place blame, I'll take it. When this was first mentioned to me about three weeks ago or four weeks ago by um, Gretchen Bennett, I failed to say anything about reaching out to the community. So if there's going to be blame, I'll take it. Um, since the last council meeting, there have been several meetings with the West Salem residents, and I am firmly believe that but for the failure to communicate, the results of those meetings would have been different. But when you have folks that have not been communicated, they use the terms like blindsided, had the rug pulled out from under me, 45, 48 hours is not good enough communication. I believe that that is the main reason of the objection. And I think that it's fair for the city to pull back on its decision until the two, uh, the two things that I mentioned earlier um, have happened. Um, I recognize that we've gotten a lot of, a lot of emails and, and I'll be the first to admit, as we heard earlier this evening, NIMBYism is alive and well in every portion of Salem. But I, I object as much to some of the emails that I received. Um, I'll read a couple of them. I am appalled that the city council would consider moving the location. I cannot believe that you are caving to a bunch of NIMBYs who are selfish and short-sighted. Selfish people rail about danger and their children. You need to ignore, you need to ignore the community. And the one that I just received, I am asking you look past the heartless, the heartless comments that came out of the community meeting in West Salem. I was at all of those meetings in West Salem. Those were not heartless comments. Those were genuine comments, especially the ones about the lack of communication. We have an opportunity here to, as some have said, create a win-win, win-win solution by pulling back this decision, moving forward with the investigation, and also taking up the citizens of West Salem on their offer to find and even help finance a place for a shelter camp to be. So I encourage my council members to vote yes on the first motion and also on the second one. Thank you, Councillor. I guess I am confused because I understand that you're wanting the two criteria are investigation and communication. And it seems like the communication part, well, granted it wasn't in the way we would have liked, it's now occurred. So it seems like number two has been accomplished. And as I understood what we voted on, we authorize staff to investigate and locate a, a micro shelter site there if it if it was suitable and if it was appropriate but they haven't yet made that determination so we don't even know yet if it's if it's for sure going to happen there so it seems like number one is happening because that was the result of our vote and number two already happened so i i'm not sure i'm understanding what reconsideration would get us well, I could address that if I, if I could. Um, please, please. We've had folks communicate with us that the failure to 
uh, at least alert them of the situation was the main factor. I, I believe withdrawing the approval and what we did two weeks ago was approve this site. We approved it under the condition that we would continue to investigate and also under the condition that we would start the communication. Starting the communication after approval is not appropriate. I believe that we can uh, show a level of respect for this issue for the West Salem residents that will increase their willingness to work with us and to help us find another site if there, one is, if there is one. But I, um, I believe that approving this site and then taking it to the neighbors was inappropriate. Uh, Councilor Stapleton. Thank you. Um, I, I actually have a lot to say. <laughs> um, I uh, was able to go to one of the meetings with Jim this last week, excuse me, Councilor Lewis this last week. Um, and I was really thankful that I did. Um, it was, it was good to be in the room and, and, and hear the feedback personally. Um, and to, yeah, it was, it was really good to be there and to see that. Um, and, um, I also want to say that to me, this topic is where philosophy and politics collide in this really messy way. Um, and. Uh, that's why um, I love philosophy, if you don't know me. Um, this idea of value of a person, of rights of each individual person, uh, how the state interacts with, with people and, and what we are as a community responsible for or, or not responsible for, um, all of those topics have been brought up um, many, many times in my email inbox and at the meeting. Um, and so, I want to say, I guess I want to talk about a little bit about, about why we, why we're here and how we got here. And I, I want to say that homelessness did not originate in any one ward. There are folks who are experiencing homelessness who are coming from all of our different wards, um, who have jobs in all of our different wards, who have family members and support systems in all of our different wards. And so it is only equitable for us as a council to instruct staff to find locations throughout our city that will help support our unhoused community, where they're from, where their family is, where their supports are, where their jobs are. Um, and so that is our ultimate goal, as I understand it. And it is also good for us to but the, the burden that that is there uh, across the city and not just in one area or one general area. So I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit. I have so many scribbled notes over here. I'm trying to sort out my feelings and thoughts here. I want to talk a little bit about communication um, that Jim brought up and it's so vital and so really important. And after the meeting, um, with Jim in West Salem, uh, I talked with Gretchen after the meeting late into the night in the parking lot about, about this idea of power and communication and, and realizing that when I walked into that meeting, there was a differential of power and, and I had that power because I am privileged enough to be sitting here tonight on council and to have relationships with staff where I understand the topic at hand. I have um, almost a year of experience of understanding this topic and understanding the goal and where we wanna go. And I have lived experience of having a managed camp right down the street from my house. And so coming into that meeting, I had so much more information and, and with that is power. And so I, I told Gretchen a, a story and I'll tell it, it's personal, I'm sorry. Um, but when my eldest was younger, she uh, was seven at the time, we, were, we took her in to get her tonsils out and uh, they found something that they weren't expecting. And uh, so they took a biopsy, which always scares you, right? Um, and the doctor was, was pretty flippant with us. And as he walked out the door, he said, um, yeah, we'll, do, we'll let you know if it's cancer. And he walked out. 
And my husband and I were left sitting there in this room with our kiddos and just grappling with this huge announcement that was so just flippantly made at me, right? And, you know, the, the rug pulled out from under me, blindsided, right? Like those are the things that you would say that to. And, and it took them a while to get back to us. And when they did, we had to call and ask for the info and, oh, nobody got back to you, but that's, that's too bad, you know, and just not caring and not kind and not considerate to what my husband and I were going through. And so for me, that experience with my daughter helps me stay in a place of empathy for the folks in West Salem who do not know as much as I do um, when it comes to this topic, uh, does not have the lived experience that I do with the positive outcomes on Portland Road. Um, and so I, it was really good for me to stay in that place of empathy. Um, I also, want to say there's been several times that it's been pointed out that, um, you know, have we gotten this much, received this much feedback on any other site? And I do want to say that political participation is really linked to privilege and economic success. And that the more we hear from people, um, it's typically from areas where they have the ability to be engaged. And I also wanted to point out that when we had meetings about um, housing individuals at the state fairgrounds or on State Street or out here on Portland Road, the folks that came, um, there may have been fewer of them, but the questions were identical. The concerns were identical. And so I wanna say that I hear folks and I understand how vital communication is and that that is an area that we need to become better at as a council and as city staff. And I'm committed to that. Um, I also know that these types of concerns and questions are this gonna be the same across every part of town, across every economic bracket, whether it's a loud question or a soft question by one person, um, the question is the same. And the value of that question is the same. And the value of all of the people that are asking these questions are the same. Now, the other thing I want to say is that there's been a lot that comes up about kids and vulnerable populations, being our senior citizens or low income folks. Um, and I guess just maybe a little background about me personally. A few years ago, my husband um, went, went shopping downtown and it was at the height of really our downtown um, homelessness crisis. And he came home and he was really just emotionally upset. And he said, you know, I had to step over somebody to get into the store and I'm not okay. And at the time we lived about a mile uh, east of here and we had our unhoused population there too. Um, they would come by and take bottles and cans that we'd leave out or whatnot. Um, but we didn't really have a, a lot of interaction. And so my husband and I made the intentional decision to move closer to downtown because we didn't want our kids to live in a world where they didn't see the reality of what's happening in our society today. We wanted our kids to see folks walking by our house with everything that they own. We wanted to have our kids see folks sleeping in the park across the street not because we are so much better than those folks, but because we are all together in this. And it's going to be a long process of coming out of that. And that means that my kids are also going to have to fight and stand up for those who are the most vulnerable in our society. There is one last thing. I'm so sorry, I'm so talky today. Um, but I wanna say that to Jim about this motion, Sorry, I'm so relaxed with this, Councillor Lewis. Um, my questions are the same as Councillor Hoy because I'm not sure what this gets us. And I mean, I understand both sides. <laughs> Let me say that. Um, you know, we've, we've already done this before. We've done this for Windows to the West, which is a great example where we all voted, yes, we want you to go and put some uh, shelters at Windows to the West, which is here in Ward 1. And 
staff went and they investigated and they did all the legwork and they did the community outreach and it came back that it wasn't feasible, right? And so when I hear folks saying you're, you're rushing this, you're cramming this, the way that we're doing things tonight is the way that we've done it in the past. And I'm, I'm not sure that I'm ready to upend that and change the process and how we're doing it because I'm not sure what it gets us and what, what the benefits or the costs are. Um, and the last thing I wanna say is that I feel like I've heard from a lot of people on this, but I haven't heard from one particular group and I'm really hoping that staff can help connect me with them. And those are the people who would benefit from this shelter. I would love to hear from the folks who are slated to be put in these shelters. I want to hear what this is meaning to them, what, what they're going to gain from this and how it will help them. Um, and with that, I'll stop talking. I'm so sorry, Council President, for the lengthy conversation. Thank you, Councilor Stapleton. Councilor Lewis. Yes, thank you, Councilor Stapleton. I, um... I appreciate your comments. A, a couple of things, if I could. Um, it, it came up earlier in, in tonight's discussion about the Pringle Hall situation. And if I'm not mistaken, there was a, a town hall um, meeting before that came before that came before council. I think even Councillor Anderson was in attendance. And that's the way to do it. Y you you bring it up, not not necessarily to to convince everybody, but you bring it up out of respect for communicating. And, and if I could read one more thing, um, this, this came in uh, late today, so from somebody who was one of the instigators, one of the motivators of putting together the meeting last Sunday at the site. Um, and the folks that attended that meeting were from the low income apartments that are right next to this site. But she wrote, thank you for your willingness to bring the site of the micro shelter camp back on the table. I believe this action will bring us all together and no matter where it ends up, even if it is at the location, this will help us come together more. And I agree with that. I think what people are asking for is to be communicated with up front, not, not till you get them to all agree, but to not blindside them. And I, and I think that that is appropriate and that's the reason for the motion tonight. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor, I understand that. I just don't know how we get there from where we're at. How it's do you easy. unring the bell? How do you yeah. unring the bell? Um, well, the council has the right to withdraw its approval and I, I'm recommending that we do that. And specifically to withdraw that approval until two things are met. One is that we've completed the analysis and, and I'm, standing ready, willing, and able that if we can't find any other place and this place is feasible, it's going to go there. I'm committed to that. But I believe we have misstepped and we need to pull back on the approval, go through the process that we should do it from, up front. And when it becomes the most viable, then we move forward. I'm in no way thinking about slowing down the train. We need these shelters everywhere. And I, my commitment is to get them done as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, I would just note that uh, I was having a conversation with uh, a resident uh, actually last week and they were commenting about how good downtown is looking and how well things are seem to be shaping up in terms of the homeless situation. And you know, I commented that, well, it's because we have reasonable alternatives and we're developing them and we're developing more all the time but we have places for people to be other than on the sidewalk. And that's what we, that's what we've committed to do as a council. And that's what this, this site does is it gets us one step further to getting people into a better situation. And so I, it's, I'm hesitant to, to stop this process because I think we need to keep moving forward because we keep, we need to keep getting uh, better places for people to be other than on the sidewalk. And, you know, the winter's coming and we still have people sleeping outside and uh, that doesn't work. That doesn't sit well with me. Councilor Stapleton. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify, Councilor Lewis. Is this that you're wanting to change 
just the way that we are doing this one site or the way that staff is conducting placing any site that's like this? Well, as, as the staff report shows, um, the Planning Commission uh, last Tuesday uh, worked on criteria for placement of shelters. That criteria could be in front of the council as early as our next meeting. Um, should we wait to look at that criteria before approving a site? I think we should. Um, I recognize that this is com zone commercial, but if you've been to the site, and I encourage you to go to the site, it is surrounded by residential, multifamily, schools, churches. Um, I'm not saying that it's not a viable place. I'm just saying that we should have communicated better. We have the opportunity to back up um, and at least show respect for people so we can encourage them to participate with us. And we have heard over and over again that they will help us find a site. And as you, I just read, there are folks that were adamant against this that are now believing that if we can take this step back, it will show a level of respect and we will get the cooperation of the folks in West Salem. Not all of them, not all of them, but a lot more than we are right now. Councilor Gonzalez. I don't know if this is what the Planning Commission would help for, but you know, um, so bottom line, you know, we, we need more housing at all levels. Um, for those that don't know, my father managed uh, St. Joseph Shelter in Mount Angel for 20 years, more than 20 years, and we lived on site. It was housing for homeless migrant men. Grew up there, uh, worked with him through my late teen years, and many of those men became lifelong friends. You know, so I'm not opposed to this site, and you know, I've been open to pretty much every site, especially going through the due diligence. Uh, but my issue, I also feel we're just sort of going through this the wrong way. Now that I've seen the results firsthand from some of the other encampments, you know, and the issue is, the issue I have is now because of what I'm seeing occurring today in Northeast Salem. You know, after Marcus Street and Hyacinth encampments were uh, cleared, it's led to multiple smaller encampments. You know, today, you could drive by today, there are um, piles of garbage next to tent, a lot of tents um, at the locations. Here are the locations, just off the top of my head, the east side of I-5 at Sunnyview, east and west side of I-5 at Silverton Road, the west side of I-5 at Market Street, a small business owner there has called me multiple times because the people that are living there um, keep breaking into his business. They broke into his business, harass his employees. Um, also on the west side of I-5 off Hawthorne, just south, south of the Red Cross building, the new Red Cross building. Um, there's actually several people today sleeping right on the Lancaster Road sidewalks, right in front of big lots where Book Bin used to be borders for those people that haven't visited this side for a while. Um, and even uh, not too far from the Hyacinth encampment near Claxter Road, they you know, they just simply moved there. You know, even those advocating for our house, they just are not happy since they feel that we don't um, have an effective garbage program and uh, don't clean the porta potties enough. You know, so I guess what I'm saying is that we're, I just feel we're setting ourselves up for a failure long-term, not just for us as, as residents, but also for the unhoused, because this, these actions create new mini communities long after the encampments go away. Um, you know, from our office, uh, you see our office is basically a pathway from downtown to Portland Road. And, you know, we've been at that office 12, 13 years, but in the last few months, I had several dangerous encounters. You know, I had a, a uh, the same fellow actually a couple times and come in and luckily nothing's happened, but he wouldn't leave the second time. The last time I saw the fellow, um, he wouldn't leave until he shot up, right, shot up drugs right there, right in front of my door. And um, another fellow pulled out a samurai sword to my, on my coworker, you know, so we don't, we as regular citizens, we don't have the tools to uh, help them. You know, people that are having obvious mental health issues, and I think that's what a lot of people are concerned about because they, they, they're not, they don't have those tools. They don't know what to do. And like Councillor Stapleton said, luckily we have some information and we're aware of these things. But if I didn't, maybe my response would have been different to those situations. Now, I think um, most of us will agree that most of us Northeast Salem uh, residents will agree that we feel it's been unfair that we've had to shoulder multiple encampments and housing sites. And, and we're going to keep doing that. 
But even with that, I'm not using that as, uh, I don't want the same for my other Salem residents. And I'm hoping that we can make adjustments to what's happening outside and around the encampments. Um, what we're asking the Church of the Park to do is really the work that uh, we want done, but nobody wants to do. So we have to not only support them, but support the neighborhoods around these encampments. So that's just um, what I wanted to share. Thank you, Council President. Uh, thank you, Councilor Gonzalez. I, I guess I'm a little bit confused by a couple of things you said, just in that those all of those campsites that you mentioned are all unmanaged. We're talking about managed micro shelter sites, which is a totally different thing, which is exactly why we want to site these kinds of places so we don't have those unmanaged situations because we know those are a failure. They don't, yeah. It doesn't work. No, I agree with you. And, I, and, the, and the reason I bring those up is because they're the result of different encampments. They Once they're broken up, what happens is when someone is hand housed, you know, you have arches, like I said, doing the work most people don't want to do. They'll go to them wherever they are to try to feed them. And they encourage them to not move around because that's the biggest issue is we push people around. They lose touch. There's no security. And then the people taking care of them can't reach it. So what happens is even even if, let's say they're um, kicked out of a safe encampment, which happened here at the fairgrounds, a lot of people were pushed out because of, you know, they weren't willing to comply with the rules which are the park did. Well, what did they do? They sort of stayed close. So at least they can get some help. And that's what I mean. It's, no, I agree with you, totally different situation. But the real result, and I've seen it firsthand, is the same people that were at these safe places, for whatever reason, it doesn't work out, they end up staying close. And then they end up just staying, you know, and then the neighbors, we don't know exactly how to help them at that situation. So if we had some kind of some opportunities and options for them after, or what happens to the people that are turned away? What happened to the people that get, you know, pushed out um, of those encampments? Because there are some, uh, Church of the Park has, you know, for most of that people, if they haven't seen it, you should definitely look into the criteria. And, and inside is very well managed, you know, but it's just what happens to the people that are pushed out of those. They'll have no options. And those are the people we see today. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Uh, Councillor Lewis. Yes, um, I've heard a, from a couple of folks um, the the fact that we may be privileged with the knowledge, and I'll agree with that. I mean, I've been on council now for seven years, and so I've watched the homeless issue as the city council has addressed it for over those seven years. Believe it or not, at the meeting at Salem Town even though it was unpleasant and there was a lot of folks yelling and screaming, there were folks that came up after the meeting and said, thank you, I didn't know. I didn't know that's how it worked. I didn't know there would be this or that. And that's, that's really to the heart of my point. If we would spend just a little bit of time up front, like we did with the Pringle Hall situation and communicate with people we're gonna neutralize those that, that just don't like it, but they recognize the value of it. And we had, don't have that opportunity now because the, the defense has gone up because of the lack of communication. If you read the emails that we've gotten over the last two weeks, two things stand out. One, very upset about not being communicated with. And two, and I just lost my thought, um, <laughs> Anyway, we can come back to you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Leon. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to, I'm thankful I'm able to come back and be able to talk about item 5B. So as many as you know, I advocate a lot for the unsheltered in the community. You know, I've lived in a shelter when I left an abusive relationship. I lived there with my child who was three at the time. Was it the best place for me? I'll tell you one thing, it wasn't comfortable, but I felt more safer there than I did at home, which tells you quite a bit about the abuse that I suffered. At the same time, I am frustrated that our city is continuing to see an increase in the number of people who are unsheltered. We've got several messages going on. We have a housing shortage. We have homeless. And also, we need to build more housing to stabilize housing, but then housing prices are at the market value or above, and people are being priced out still. Renting is still difficult because rent for an apartment is at least $900, depending on whether it's a one-bedroom or more apartment. 
how can a studio cost eight hundred dollars when i first moved to oregon my first apartment was a two bedroom one bath that was five hundred eighty dollars when i last looked that same apartment nothing's been done to it is now closer to nine hundred dollars the apartment i lived in until last year when i first moved in was about eight hundred eighty dollars when I left last year, it was $1,280. And now because it was renovated, even though there are new apartments out right across the street, this three bedroom apartment now costs us about $1,400 to $1,500. There's also new homes being built in Salem, South Salem. The cheapest is that I've seen so far is about 300,000 K. That's a starting point for a 2.5 ish bedroom townhome. Otherwise, if you have a larger family, you'll be lucky to find a home for a four bedroom for $450,000. Though the more I've been looking, the, I've seen them closer to 500 and more. And yet here we are again. Every year since I have been on council, we continue to discuss our homeless, our unsheltered community. The majority of council has voted to remove the homelessness from the sidewalk. We've tried camping at Cascade and Wallace. Those are now finished. Now here we have a new possible location west that is, involves micro sheltering. However, as you all seen from the emails and possibly phone calls, we have many people who are concerned. They're both in support and wanting to help the homeless, but they are also concerned and that they're not being heard and these individuals deserve a right to be heard. We do need to work together to identify support for the homeless. The homeless numbers are growing. That's that much we know. At the same time, I expect from the same people to advocate for programs and locations where the homeless are that would be a reasonable space, not hidden away, not in flood, point, flood prone regions or areas where they have to trek for miles to be able to get to programs or support services. I also resent the idea that several people wrote that just because someone is homeless, it doesn't mean that they're a drug addict. It doesn't mean that they're lazy. Many of them had jobs. Many of them are parents. Some of them are even teenagers. And how can it be possible to judge someone when you yourself may not have been in that same situation? I have. And I could tell you that living in a shelter is not a home, but it was my safe space when I needed to get away from my home at the time. Because I feel that it's important to ensure that the community has a say and a voice in the matter, I'm going to vote with Councillor Lewis and Asset City staff continue to engage in conversations to be able to identify spaces where the unsheltered can and feel safe and welcome, while also ensuring that our community members, our residents are heard. At the same time, we also need to be able to treat our unsheltered people like people, not chattel. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Council President Hoy. Um, I, I'm going to ask uh, when I'm finished if the city attorney could comment on whether I'm correct or not. But my understanding of it is the effect of the resolution or the motion we passed was to direct the staff to to look at this site and 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 explore it and come back with. Uh, uh, will not come back, but make a recommendation on their own under the council manager's emergency powers as to whether or not this site would work. For example, things have come up about uh, is there water in there? Is there a, is it a flood water, et cetera? And so I, I think the effect of our motion was to do uh, for the staff to do further diligence to decide if this was an appropriate spot totally. And if that's the case, uh, the, the issues that Councillor Lewis raised of communication and, and neighborhood comment and further investigation can st will still be done under our, our resolution as passed. Um, the second thing I'd like uh, staff to comment on if they could, and we've discussed this a little bit, but I, I would be very interested if we could hear about the experience with other similar managed temporary shelters that we have set up at various other parts of the of the city. Um, the final thing I want to say is uh, a little bit about Pringle Park. Well, actually, two things I want to say. First one is a little bit about Pringle Park. That is in my ward. The situation, I agree with Council President Hoy, the situation there was different in terms it was a drop-in during the day uh, place and 
Pringle Hall is used in the evenings for all sorts of other uh, um, city functions and private functions. And uh, that was part of the difference between those two in terms of overnight. Uh, there was never any sort of situation where it was going to be a managed overnight camp. Second thing is I was informed of that by city staff prior to that. And uh, I helped arrange a, a meeting there so we could discuss these things beforehand. And we did that, and that was helpful to the city staff. But that's what I did as, as a member of the ward. Uh, finally, um, there is a concern that things should be spread throughout the uh, city. And I agree with that. And I will tell you that I have already, I rode my bike by the place on Wallace Road today. And yesterday, I rode over by a place on 13th Street, um, about rural, that is in War II that is being uh, considered by the staff for the exact same type of program. And uh, I support the staff looking into that. And if they come back and say, this is a viable place, I will support that situation uh, in, in Ward 2. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Lewis. Yes, I remember now. There, there are two things that the emails that we've received over the last uh, 10, week, 10 days one was was the fact that people were, were truly upset about being blindsided with the lack of knowledge. The second that stood out to me was the lack of understanding, the lack of knowledge of exactly what, what we're doing with these uh, shelters. There is a drastic lack of knowledge. Uh, we, we heard it at the meeting in Salem Town. Lack of knowledge because they've never had the opportunity to hear you can say all you want, we, they, you know, they're citizens, they can go into the website, but we know that people don't. And when things happen, they, they want the opportunity to be involved, even if it's just from an information standpoint. And to Councillor Anderson's uh, comment, I, I believe the uh, motion that was passed was to authorize the city, authorize the city manager to establish a managed temporary camp at 2700 Wallace Road Northwest. If I'm mistaken, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take that. But I believe that the motion that was passed was to authorize the manager to establish the camp, not to talk about it first, but to establish it. And now we're talking about it later. And I just think that the cart's before the horse and we need to change that. Mr. Uh, Anderson. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm looking at the motion we just passed today, which was uh, 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 5A, which uh, that was the emergency declaration till June of next year. And I'm looking at the explanation and it says city council, this is written by the city attorney. City council recently authorized a second outdoor managed micro shelter site at 2700 Wall Wallace Road Northwest if the site is determined to be feasible for operations, the micro shelter site will be operated by Church in the Park. So whatever the motion said, the staff interpretation of that is, and I think it's the correct one is, uh, if the staff determines it to be appropriate. And there are a number of reasons why it may or may, the staff may or may not determine it's, it, it would be appropriate. Some of which I've discussed and others of which Councillor Lewis has discussed. So. Um, you know, it's it, it, some of the emails we get say, how can you establish it? How can you make this, a whole, you know, this, this camp a homeless shelter? Well, that hasn't happened yet. And that was not the uh, um, result of the motion we passed two weeks ago. And I, I submit, and it's in the, it's in the minutes of the meeting. So, you know, if somebody could pull that up and read it, but uh, the recollection I have of what was passed two weeks ago was that the city council was giving, authorizing the city manager to establish a managed temporary camp. That was how people took it in West Salem. As far as the uh, 5A that we passed uh, this evening, I, I mentioned, and I'll mention again, that resolution 2021-11 established basic requirements for managed camps that they not be located in single family residential zones. Granted, this is a commercial zone, but if you look at the site, it is surrounded by multifamily, single family, 
uh, senior living, assisted care living. So if this is not in the middle of a residential zone, I don't know what it is. It's not called a resident residential zone, but in fact, it is a residential zone. Well, counselors, the difference I heard between those two things is uh, we authorized them to establish it. We did not direct them, which gives them discretion should certain things, should it not be suitable. We gave them the discretion to make that evaluation. So that, that's how I read it. Now, well, Councilor Lewis you know, says, hold, hold on just one second. I'm not done. Please don't interrupt. I'll give you a chance. That also, Councilor Lewis has spent a good deal of time tonight characterizing emails that we've received. And I, I just feel compelled to state how a lot of a theme that I heard in a lot of the emails. It was a very disturbing thing. And it was a, it was a, a theme of dehumanizing people who are homeless, people who are unsheltered, uh, villainizing them. And it was very upsetting to me. Uh, I don't know how many emails that we received asking whether we're screening for pedophiles. I mean, that, that kind of that kind of characterization of people just because they happen to be homeless is outrageous. And when when we dehumanize a group, that's what allows us to treat them less than. And that's what was happening here. And it uh, it's not OK. And uh, that's what I read from a lot of the emails. So I just wanted to put that out there as a theme that, that I heard. I think I saw Councillor Stapleton with your hand up and then we'll get back to Councillor Lewis. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had asked a question of staff. I, I hadn't heard back from them yet on it, um, but that was a question of, of this idea of no longer or not letting them be in residential zones. And actually I just so council knows, I'm not sure I'm okay uh, with restricting them from residential uh, zoning. Um, I have some concerns about that because of the dehumanizing factor that Councilor President Hoy was just talking about. Um, because to me, saying that states that they are not worthy of residential zoning uh, because of their housing situation. So that's really hard for me. And I and I also asked if we allowed, you know, halfway homes or um, transitional homes or uh, any kind of homes like that in residential um and if that was okay then then why is it not okay to have um have something like a pellet shelter location in in a residential area thank you counselor counselor lewis uh counselor stapleton i absolutely agree um if i were one of those 60 people who would be in the shelter I don't want to be stuck in the bowels of some park. I would rather be in a community. Um, heaven forbid, as I mentioned at the meeting at Salem Town, that the communities around these shelters embrace them, adopt them, bring cookies. And as you remember, that didn't get a real good sounding. But to Councillor Hoy's point, I absolutely agree. Some of the comments that I heard from my fellow citizens in West Salem were disgusting. I, I want us to think about separating those two issues. The lack of communication caused such a, a level of anxiety that the worst was brought out in people. But for that lack of communication, there still would have been people who felt the, who made those comments, but I don't think it would have been as great and I believe we would have avoided the situation to a great extent if we had just communicated up front and then went for the authorization. I'm not asking to slow things down. I'm asking to take a step sideways. And quite frankly, if we can do this and we get the buy-in from the folks in West Salem, then we might be able to move a whole lot quicker than we will if there's gonna be constant dragging of feet. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, Mr. Powers, did you have anything you wanted to add to this conversation or other staff members? Thank you, Co Council President Hoy. Uh, you know, this, this discussion has been very helpful for staff. Uh, the unsheltered crisis continues, as evidenced by your action earlier this evening, a, a crisis that really doesn't have any uh, sign of ending, as, as was, uh, I think, shared by several counselors. Uh, the difficulty in locating sites has just increased. Uh, we're trying to land on the head of a pin, uh, frankly. 
Uh, we're looking at, at, at city-owned property. We're looking at city-owned property that's unused or underused, and, and with that comes you know, other challenges. Uh, there is no there is no perfect or ideal site. Uh, outreach was done. Uh, clearly, uh, we need to do better next time, and, and we will do better next time. We certainly welcome any proposal, any offer of alternate locations, and we will we will run those down as as quickly as, as possible because the, the urgency you know, of the crisis uh, continues. And I want to really reinforce what was stated earlier, and that is no site, including Wallace Road, will proceed if the analysis indicates that it's not workable. If it's not workable for the people that, who, that need the help, and, and, and Gretchen Bennett can, can speak to uh, the unsheltered residents, the unsheltered neighbors who would be helped at, at this site and who are being helped at other managed uh, shelter locations. And also I want to promise you and, and promise those who are, who are watching that regardless of the outcome of that analysis, that outcome will be communicated. We're certainly hearing loud and clear that the importance of communication is going to increase as this crisis continues, as the challenges of locating sites uh, continues. So I would uh, ask if, if it's uh, acceptable to you, uh, Mr. Council President, that we uh, allow Gretchen Bennett to speak to some of the specific questions that were asked uh, this evening about the, uh, the shelter site the shelter services uh, specifically. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Powers and Ms. Bennett. Sure, this is Gretchen Bennett staff and thank you so much for the opportunity. And I am really looking forward to every conversation that I'm able to have. I absolutely share the value and the desire of talking with people about these issues. Um, I am hearing from people who are um, working with people at the locations of how important it's been to have a place with a door that locks and with security on, sta on site. Um, being able to access jobs and services is difficult when you can't lock up your items or when you can't charge your cell phone or when you can't leave to go to work. And the micro shelter communities have afforded that kind of stability. Um, there are people who are unsheltered who could directly succeed in affordable housing. And when we have that option, they certainly go directly there. Um, but for people for whom a transition to be able to um, have that stability to prepare to access affordable housing and to work with case managers at Salem Housing Authority and others, this has been a really key a space of transition is what we've learned. Um, I've been hearing positive things from the neighbors near the existing sites that we have and want to chase down any complaint or concern that emerges um, at those locations. I've, I've been hearing that we've been able to be good neighbors in the locations that we've been able to manage so far. Um, let's see. I think that might have addressed the questions. Please forgive me if I missed something. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Councilor Phillips. Thank you, uh, Council President Hoy, and uh, thank you, Gretchen Bennett, for for the, answering those questions. Um, you know, just a brief background. You know, as an emergency room doctor here in Salem, Oregon, caring for patients um, in our community who who have the experience of being homeless. I mean, th there is a crisis that is time sensitive um, that's facing our community. I served on the homeless task force with uh, Councillor Lewis, uh, you know, back in 2018, and the problem has not improved since that that time because of you know the nature of overlapping you know problems and crises. But I, I I just my main question is if this motion, which I'm very skeptical of in terms of trying to address the crisis. Like the main perspective, the, the reason why I volunteered to show up and do this was to make an impact on this issue. Um, and 
And again, like if we're going to make an issue, we're gonna, if we're going to make an impact on this issue, we're going to have to do difficult things. And, and I'm perfectly okay with having a managed uh, campsite or shelter in every single ward, including my own. And I've talked to staff in the past about this, and I know that staff is looking in every single ward. But my, my fear is if this, if this motion were to proceed tonight is that it would slow things down when this is in fact a time sensitive crisis. Can you speak to that? Is If we change our mind uh, from two weeks ago and, and approve this motion, would you foresee it slowing things down? I think it would depend on the timing of when we have clarity on the two questions. We're at work right now on Councillor Lewis's direction. I'm listening to every site recommendation and being open to any meeting or gathering. Uh, we have another one that we're contemplating with in partnership with the Neighborhood Association. I suppose at some point one has to call at what point when we conclude there's no other site suggestions emerging. Um, we're also studying the feasibility. Despite the initial maps telling us that the area was not a wetland, for example, input caused us to pause and take another look at that. And I won't place micro shelters on the site unless we confirm it's actually feasible. And the additional input is, has led to further research on that. So we're already at work on the two directions. And so I suppose if like, let's say for example, I get no new inquiries or suggestions, but we're a week or two away from a council meeting, it could cause a delay of that week or two to, to need to come back and ask the question. I suppose it would be a matter of timing. But just to clarify, and, and I process by speaking out loud, so thank you for bearing with me. Um, what I'm hearing you say is if there's a flood issue that makes this not feasible, it would not happen. I heard that from you as well as uh, the city uh, manager and I trust you. I mean, I believe that uh, we authorize the city staff to proceed with looking into uh, creating managed camping or sheltering at the old UGM, and it was found unfeasible. Am I incorrect in how we proceeded on that? You're not. We have, we have two examples of initially authorizing an idea and then upon further study it not working. Windows to the West and old UGM. I should clarify the other part of the parcel at Wallace is paved. So certainly if the grassland is confirmed to be wetland, that's a stop on the grass. The current city owned piece of land that is paved, we're trying to understand, is it feasible? How many would be feasible at, on that? And then should we access the ODOT portion that would expand feasibility? So there's really three pathways of inquiry right now that we're researching on the Wallace site. You're absolutely correct in your understanding that if we discover something that causes a site to be unfeasible, we will not proceed. Thank you. I trust thank you. you and thank you for, for confirming that. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Council Lewis. You're on mute, Councilor. You're on mute, Councilor. Thank you. you uh, Gretchen, I don't want to put you on the spot. So let me pose the question this way. If you could go back in time, would you be more deliberate about communication with the folks around the site? Or do you think we've done a job that we can be proud of? Thank you. I would substitute the word deliberate for I would increase what I did. I um, absolutely thought and considered uh, various types of options related to communications. And if I had to do over again, I would have expanded and increased the number of communications I did greatly. I think there's a number of people who are interested in this conversation who want information. And I appreciate that. And that's certainly been reinforced and clear to me. Um, I think that it's the work of citing locations is, um, is difficult. And there are many who I don't know uh, would 
um, desire to be at the center of a decision around something like that. But that's what we pay all of you the big bucks for as volunteers, right, is to be at the end of the day, the decision makers. Um, but to bring more people into the process, absolutely. For example, we did a news release to the media saying, help, we're really struggling with finding locations, please help us. And that kind of outcry and community conversation, I would have expanded so much more. And Ms. Bennett, I just want to say, uh, I, I just want to apologize on behalf of this council that you were, uh, that your work maybe have, has just been disparaged as possibly being not worthy of being proud. I'm very proud of the work you do. I think you work very hard. And I think all of the city staff work very hard. And could we do things better? Of course, sometimes we could do things better, but you're being pulled in a thousand directions. You're one person doing a monumental job and I appreciate your work very much. Oh, thank you. But no offense and not, not, no offense has been taken. I am absolutely delighted to expand communications to clarify what that looks like and how our community wants to talk about and engage in this question. It's, it's a super fascinating question to me and I'm, I'm all ears for anyone who wants to talk about it. And I appreciate that very much. Thank you. I think feel like we've uh, sort of yeah. run this topic into the ground. Councilor Lewis. Yeah, I want to make one more comment. If my words were misinterpreted, that I don't have the greatest deal of respect for for Ms. Bennett, then um, then maybe she can tell you what I've been saying in public about her over the last ten days. I think the pressure that's been put on her is is just insurmountable, and quite frankly, it was that pressure from the work that she's been doing, from the surveys that we got from the citizens, the the importance of getting the homeless issue addressed. But I, again, want to separate the issue of communication. And I believe that we did not communicate. I don't believe there was any outreach to, let's say, for example, Salem Town, 450 homeowners. I don't believe that we heard from the multifamily. I think we reached out to them, just like we reached out to the school, but I don't believe we heard back from them. And whether that's because they were doing the ostrich interpretation or not, the folks were not communicated with. And I believe that that set us on the wrong track. We have an opportunity to right that track. And if I go back to the motion, we'll hold off the approval until the staff is done with their work. So it's not gonna slow things down with the exception of the possible idea of staff does finishes their work on Tuesday and it's two weeks before the next council meeting. Thank you, Councillor. So by way of reminder, we are the, the question before us is, are we going to reconsider our earlier decision? So if this were to pass, then we'll have a chance to debate the topic. And if, we, if it doesn't, then we wouldn't, I suppose. But um, so just as a reminder, that's the actual question before us right now. It's the first question is, shall we reconsider our previous action as I understand it? Mr. Atchison, is that correct? That's correct. So everybody's clear. Thank you. If there's nothing further, I'll ask the recorder to call the roll. Councillor Nordyke. I'm sorry, my connection is unstable. Can you repeat that, please? Are you calling the vote on Councillor Lewis's motion? Yes. Yes. The, yes. The question is, shall we reconsider our previous vote? The question is, shall we reconsider? I vote nay. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Stapleton. No. Councillor Anderson. No. Councillor Phillips. No. Councillor Leung. Yes. Councillor Gonzalez. Yes. Excuse me. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Hoy. No. The mayor Motion Bennett fails. Is absent. Motion fails. Thank you. All right. Uh, on to uh, pulled consent items. Councillor Anderson, item 3.3C. You're on mute, Councillor. I move staff recommendation. 
Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Councilor Leon. Thank you. If I may speak to it, and all these yes, please. Um, um, 3C, 3E, and 3F are all kind of connected. And so my comments on 3C, which is the first one, I think will relate to all of them. Um, I'm interested in a couple things. First one is, um, why is it necessary to buy the entire parcel versus just buying the the the, the parcel needed for the actual right of way of the um, uh, Marine Drive? And the second one is, at one point I think we had, I don't want to either eight million or three million dollars. I can't remember which it was. I think it was eight million dollars. So I would also want to know. How far are we? How much of that money is left? Do we anticipate we'll be able to write uh, to buy all the right away? Those are the questions I have for staff. All right, uh, Councilor Anderson, it's Kristen Rutherford, Urban Development Director. And I also have Clint Dameron, who is our real estate manager here at the meeting this evening, uh, who can speak to the funding issue as well. Um, the reason that we are buying these properties in the entirety rather than just the right of way is that these properties are partially within the city limits and partially outside the city limits and with the, within the UGB. So to purchase just the right of way, we would have to go through an annexation process, yeah. bring them into the city, then go through the partition. And we're looking at a year, year plus to go through that whole process. So, um, to be more expedient in acquiring these properties and in working with property owners that are, are ready to sell their properties, we're moving forward with the entire acquisitions. And then we will have um, portions of these properties that will be used in the future for stormwater, some portions for the marine drive right of way, and then also uh, remainders that could be used for affordable housing development in the future once we've completed the land use process. If I may interrupt, thank you. That's very that's very helpful because I recall at one point there was some concern about the proposed route of Marine Drive was maybe outside the UGB mm -hmm. and not, and, uh, and so there were some big questions about whether or not we needed to do things. And I know there was an issue on that did Luba would require us to do that or would Luba say you don't have to because it's sort of like an incidental part that goes out of the, the, the drive. And so what you're saying is we will resolve that issue by buying everything. And what I also understand you're saying is uh, uh, the land will not necessarily remain fallow. It, it could two purposes, one sort of wetland uh, storage or uh, other um, wetland uh, mitigation as well as the potential of now it's our property uh, we could put certainly irony here we could put some low-income or affordable housing on, on the the rest of the property that isn't used for the right away or the other um, uh, wetland sort of remediation yeah and we will still have to go through all of those same processes sure. it's okay. just we'll be doing it with it under our control and not okay. impacting the sellers Thank you. And then you also had a question about funding. So um, for these acquisitions, we're using a mix of funding sources. We're using the balance of the marine of the bridge bond funding, uh, about I think 1.4 million remaining there. We're using um, some stormwater funds, and then we're also using some of our ARPA funds. And is the stormwater funds because you would imagine that some sort of do with the mitigation and uh, um, okay. Correct. Yes. And I'm sorry, I didn't understand the the third oh. source of funding. Those are our ARPA funds. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Our now quotes. I understand yeah. that. I know that acronym. Okay, -A -A thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, oh, so Clint doesn't have to tell us anything more. You've just told us. Well, I guess my question is, do we have enough money out of those three sources to buy the remaining parcels? And I think there might be four remaining. I may be wrong on that. I, I will ask Clint to jump in here in terms of funds that that we have. This will exhaust the bridge funds, okay. Okay. but um, I, I can have Clint speak to any other questions you may have about that. And I also see Director Fernandez is lit up here, so he's uh, ready to answer <laughs> any other questions you may have too. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Council Anderson, Clint Damron, uh, Real Property Services Manager. Uh, these uh, acquisitions having to buy them all in entirety will drain everything 
until unless we council decided to surplus some of the property we are gaining. At this point, we have reached out to every property owner uh, along the alignment that we were directed to uh, three times. Uh, we only heard from uh, four to six total. Uh, we've reached deals with four folks uh, and we're still uh, in negotiations with one other, but uh, the rest have either had no interest, no contact or just a, a cursory interest. So at some point we may end up going to some sort of condemnation proceeding to get some of the, the right away. Uh, if that would be a council's decision. Yeah. Okay. Too. Okay. But that, that might be the only way. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Councilor Nordyke. Thank you. Um, the only question that I have actually just relates to the fact that apparently this will involve some degree of ARPA funds. And at some point, I would like our uh, mayor, who's not here, of course, I would like us to talk about what are we, what is our plan for remaining ARPA funds? I would like to see that as a future agenda item. We need to discuss the millions of dollars that were given to us by the federal government and a strategic plan to use those funds. And so I would like to see that as a separate agenda item at an upcoming meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, I think we've articulated that to the manager and he intends to fulfill that as I understand it. Anything else? Will the recorder please call the roll? Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Phillips? Aye. Councillor Leung? Aye. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Mayor Bennett is absent. Motion passes. Thank you. Councillor Anderson, item 3.3E. Uh, I move the staff recommendation to acquire the property. Second. Um, move the second of discussion? Yeah, we've already had the discussion, I think. So unless any other, but any, unless this is appreciably different than what we already discussed, I think I'm ready to vote on it. Any other questions or comments? Uh, will the recorder please call the roll? Councilor Stapleton. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Phillips. Aye. Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Councillor Nordyke, I think she's frozen. She's frozen. We'll <laughs> go back. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Mayor Bennett is absent, and Councillor Nordyke. I'll have to revisit that later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. Councilor Lewis, item 3.3F. Uh, yes, I move staff recommendation. Second. Discussion? Just a couple of, of comments um, that haven't been addressed in the other, uh, the other two polls. Um, one, as the, uh, as the co-chair of the Streets and Bridges bond measure in 2008 with uh, former Councilor Nanke, I am both excited and, uh, and happy that we have now come to the end of the money from the Streets and Bridges bond. Hopefully there will be money coming down for the completion of Marine Drive. Marine Drive, as, uh, as hopefully we will remember, was on the top of the list of the Congestion Relief Task Force. And so it's good to see at least that, uh, that movement happening. But the one thing I wanted to add, especially for the uh, folks in West Salem, the purchase of these properties will allow us to have ownership on what will become Beckett Street. Becca Street is one of those uh, connections between Wallace and Marine Drive, making it crucial for the functionality of Marine Drive. And so I couldn't be happier about that. And uh, hopefully uh, everybody will agree. Thank you, Councillor. Anything else? Any other discussion? If the recorder will please call the roll. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. 
Councillor Stapleton? Aye. And Mayor Bennett is absent. Motion passes. And uh, does the city recorder want to go back to Councillor Nordyke on our previous vote? Absolutely. Councillor Nordyke, how would you like to register your vote for item 5.D? One moment. I apologize for the connectivity issues, everyone. <laughs> so that would have been item 3.3E. Oh, okay. Have I sorry, I heard something different there. 3.3E. My vote is aye. Thank you. Motion still passes. Thank you. All right. That concludes um, special orders of business. We have one information report. I don't know if I've ever seen just one information report, but that's what we have tonight. Anything on that for staff or any comments? Seeing none, we are on to uh, ordinances and first readings. Uh, item 7.1A, city recorder, please. Ordinance bill number 1121, an ordinance relating to general assessment procedures amending SRC 21.090. Councilor Anderson, do you have a motion? Yes, I do. I move staff recommendation that we conduct first reading of ordinance bill number 1121 to adopt a 0% interest rate on assessments of certain infrastructure projects and schedule a second reading of the ordinance. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Will the recorder please call the roll? Councilor Phillips. Aye. Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Gonzalez. Aye. Councilor Foy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Lewis. Aye. Councilor Stapleton. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. And Mayor Bennett is absent. Motion passes. Item 7.1B. City Recorder. Excuse me. Ordinance Bill number 1221, an ordinance vacating public right of way located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Liberty Road South and Pembroke Street Southeast. Councilor Anderson. Thank you. I move we advance ordinance bill 1221 vacating public right of way located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Liberty Road South and Pembroke Street Southeast to second reading for an act. Second. Seconded by Councilor Phillips. Any discussion? If the recorder will please call the roll. Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Gonzalez? Aye. Councilor Hoy? Aye. Councilor Nordyke? Aye. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Councilor Stapleton? Aye. Councilor Anderson? Councilor Anderson? Aye. <laughs> Councilor Phillips? Aye. And Mayor Bennett is absent. Thank you. Motion passes. All right, on to second readings then. Uh, and on this one, Councilor Anderson, we need your motion first. And this is off of the email. Yeah, I've got it. Um, I move to approve the amendment amendments to the engrossed ordinance bill number 3-21 and proceed to second reading as engrossed. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, do we have the title from the city reporter, please? Engrossed ordinance bill number 321, an ordinance relating to extension of the multiple unit housing tax incentive program amending SRC 2.800, 0 0.830, and 0 0.835. Any discussion? Okay. Nope. Sorry. That's okay. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Lewis. Aye. Councilor Stapleton. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Phillips. Aye. Councilor Leung. Aye. Mayor Bennett is absent. 
Motion passes. All right, item 7.2B. Ordinance Bill number 1021, an ordinance declaring and proclaiming certain territory located at 681 Reese Hill Road Southeast, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing, prescribing Salem Area Comprehensive Plan map designation, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the Salem Suburban Rural Fire Protection District. Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Lewis. Aye. Councilor Stapleton. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Phillips. Aye. Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Gonzalez. Aye. Aye. Mayor Bennett is absent. Motion passes. And just confirming from staff that we have nobody signed up under number eight. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you so much. I just want to thank you all for uh, taking this journey with me tonight. <laughs> I think it went all right. I think we had good discussion. I appreciate everybody's comments. I appreciate all of your service to the city. So with that, we are adjourned. For more videos and for more information, go to capitalcommunitymedia.org and follow us on social media.